C++ is an object-oriented programming language. So what does this mean, object-oriented? It refers to the object-oriented paradigm, meaning the method by which we can create objects of different types, but not just different, but user-defined types. Up to this point, you've been using basic primitive types in C++, the ints and the floats and the bools and etc. But you've found that they have their limitations. You can't describe adequately an entity in real life, like a table or a chair or a certain kind of animal, a cat or a building or whatever, using just those types. It's not enough. And you might have thought, well, you know, it would be really nice if I'm going to model a kennel, if I could declare a dog object. But there are no dog objects or types in C++. But now you can build such a thing. The object-oriented paradigm allows you to create your own types in C++. And you're going to do that with something called a class. And you've seen structs already in, in, this, in these lessons. And a class is very much like a struct. So here's the concept. The idea is to bundle together different data types into one type. But not only data types, the functionality that is going to define how these objects are going to interact with each other and interface with other entities. We call this encapsulation. Our basic building block is called the class. And of course, keywords are class, public, and private. So if you look at this syntax, you see that it's very much like a struct. In fact, if you were to get rid of the public and the private and replace the keyword class with struct, it would be exactly the same. You are indeed defining a new class of objects in your language. And there are two different sections in a class, the public and the private. What goes where? The private section of the class defines an area that cannot be directly accessed from outside of the class. That is to say, the members in the private section can't be called or accessed or changed or manipulated from any entity outside of the class itself, like from another function, perhaps main. So we're going to place our data members there. The member variables are going to be in the private section of the class. That's where they are protected from inadvertent change or change that we do not allow. That change is only going to come from the functions that are in the public section of the class. So the functions in the public section are going to dictate how the object state can be changed. They're going to be the public interface. Now it is the case that data can go in public and private. Functions can go in public and private. However, it only makes sense to put data in the private section. That's the purpose of a class. Does it make only good sense to put functions into the public section of the class? No, that's not the case. Quite often that you have functions not only in the public but also in the private. But the functions in the private section, again, can only be accessed by the functions in the public section. I like to call the functions down in the private section as being helper functions. For instance, you might have a public function that does a lot of stuff and you want to break it down into smaller tasks. You can put some of those smaller tasks in the private section where they wouldn't normally be called by anybody outside of the class. Let's take a look at your very first class. Throughout this part of the semester, we're going to work with a particular class as an example. It's the class for fractions. You cannot declare a fraction in C++. There is no such thing. Well, we're going to build a class of objects we name fraction so that you can indeed declare fractions now and work with fractions. So again, we have our class and the name of the type, which is fraction. Now, I want to give you this caveat at this point. The fraction class that I'm going to build over the next several lessons is not a fraction class that I personally would build if I was going to use it. The functions that I'm going to use to demonstrate classes in this particular example, I've put in here not because I think they would really be good for a fraction class, but because they demonstrate uh, the principles that I'm trying to show you. OK, so here's our public section and the member functions. And we have four of them. And notice that these are the prototypes for the functions. I have my return type. I have my name. And because of the parenthesis, we know that that is a function. I've got 
four functions, as I said. Avoid read in. What that's going to do is to allow a user to read information into the member variables of the object. We have a print function, which is going to print out the information that's contained in the data. We have a reciprocal function that is going to return a fraction. And we have an unreduce function, which takes a integer and returns nothing. And what it's going to do is change the object by multiplying numerator and denominator by the same value. And of course, in the private section, we have the member data of this class of objects. Of course, a fraction is made up of a numerator and a denominator. And just like with a struct, you only want to put in the data list elements that describe the state of this kind of object. One detail that uh, might come in handy, in a class, anything inside the curly braces that is not otherwise designated as public or private is private by default. These two ways of writing this class are exactly the same. It's much preferable, I think, to put the private. It makes it clearer. OK, so how do we put all this together? A class definition, what I call a class definition, and what some would call a, a class declaration, is this, just like a struct. And it's best to put it in its very own header, named appropriately. So in fraction.h, I have my class fraction. And I wouldn't want to put anything else in this header except any constants that might be associated with fractions. In this case, there are none. This would be the only thing in that header. The idea is that you can pick this up and move it from project to project. Now, we're also going to have an associated implementation file, a CPP file, a fraction.cpp, which is going to contain the definitions of these member functions right here. They're not defined here. You don't see those definitions. And in fact, I'm not going to go over that in this lesson. What I want to show you is how this object is going to be used. Let's go to our main here. In our main function, we want to pound include the fraction header so that the compiler knows what a fraction is. So here in this line, I have declared two fractions, f and g. Again, it's just like any other declaration. The type is fraction. The objects are named f and g. Our next line of code. Is this legal? No, it's not legal. OK, this will not compile. Why not? Why won't this compile? Why can I not? change the numerator of my fraction. And this is how I would do it if it was a struct, right? I use the dot operator. I say f, this object, its numerator, its member variable, as indicated by the m underscore, its member variable numerator, I want to set that equal to 7. Why can't I do that? Well, remember, it's in the private section of the class. This is not directly accessible in any function that is not a member function of the class. Well, main is not a member function of the class, and that's what I'm trying to do in main. All I can do is have f call its read-in function. It can call its print function. It can call its unreduce function. But it cannot directly change member variables. And so that's the basis of the object-oriented paradigm. In the next lesson, I'm going to show you how to define those functions, how they work, and the whole concept of a calling object. If we go back just a step here, in these three lines, f calls its read-in function, print function, and unreduced function. f is called the calling object. It's the object that's calling those member functions. So we'll take a look at the details in the next lesson.